Hi, hey everyone. So I'm Sebastian. Um, I'm indeed the founder of uh, Allegorithmic, and uh, I want to talk today about augmented artistry and especially what uh, procedural techniques can bring to uh, 3D artists. So a few words about the company first. Um, this image uh, is very representative to, uh, to us. <laughs> this is what we are. We have flaws, um, and we like, uh, we like texturing. And so the texturing uh, idea is to go from the left thing that has no color, uh, no uh, um, way of representing reflections into something that you, you can find on the right with all the details you, you saw um, on the previous image. So all the fine details uh, in, this, in this image, which is a fake, it's a 3D rendering, uh, have been done using um, techniques to create uh, these textures, right? So um, we, for this, we, we introduced uh, something called Substance, uh, you, might, you might know uh, about. Uh, Substance is a set of tools, and we have two main tools, uh, which are one tool dedicated to the digital materials, uh, which is called Substance Designer. It helps people actually create uh, the digital materials. And it's a node base, it has a node base interface. Uh, it's a, a way of uh, processing inputs, whether they are purely procedural inputs like noise functions or images or whatever you could think of and turn that into something that represents uh, a digital material such as albedo map, a normal map, um, roughness maps, metallic maps, uh, all the maps you'd need uh, for you to represent a, um, uh, with high fidelity, uh, represent uh, digital materials uh, in a rendering. We also have Substance Painter, that we like, to, we like to talk about it as the Photoshop of 3D. It's a, it's a very simple way of uh, presenting it, but basically it's, it's very similar to Photoshop in its uh, philosophy, where you have um, layers uh, on which you, um, uh, you work to add details to your object. So, in, in, um, I mean, uh, where a Substance Designer is used to create the digital materials, let's say, on a sphere or on a plane, Substance Painter is here to actually paint and apply these materials onto an object, an actual object that has a shape. And you want to take that shape into account uh, to uh, come up with the final material that is dedicated to that uh, material, that uh, asset. So this is Substance Painter, and Substance Painter is uh, pretty uh, successful. For so last year, uh, only it's been launched uh, 10 million times uh, uh, in 2017. Uh, and uh, since the beginning of the year, it's been launched one, more than 1 million times uh, per, per month. So it's, um, it's a fairly um, significant number, and uh, it's growing very, very fast. So a lot of people are actually using uh, Substance Painter. And overall, the Substance set of tools are used by a lot of uh, game developers. You might, might have heard of uh, Uncharted 4 by Naughty Dog. Uh, it's been pretty much entirely uh, textured using Substance, the Substance set of tools. Um, also games like uh, Call of Duty and, and more and more games, but basically, uh, a lot of, uh, pretty much 90 plus percent of uh, AAA game developers actually use Substance uh, uh, today. We also see Substance being used in more and more uh, production for feature films, like uh, for Logan. Um, actually, if you focus on the, on the arm and the wound here, uh, you will see something. Okay, so there was a before and after, right? So this actually bullet has been textured with substance. So <laughs> that was that was the start was for us, right? So we're super happy to, to see that. Uh, it's uh, also uh, uh, gaining gaining traction in uh, in visual effects animation. Um, the the list is less impressive, but it's growing, and uh, you have beautiful names in there. Uh, people um, like Double Negative, The Mill, Frame Store, etc., MPC, etc. Right, uh, but as soon as you want to, to have a, um, a lifelike representation of a, of a scene, uh, such as in architecture, you want uh, um, good materials as well. So uh, we also see substance being used more and more by architectural firms, and uh, this is an example where all the materials have been done uh, using a combination of scans and uh, procedural techniques with substance. Uh, and uh, here again, the list is small but growing fast. And where it's um, actually the list is uh, growing faster even is in industrial design. Industrial design means going from a CAD uh, design for an object, an actual object that will be produced at the end of the process uh, to, um, to uh, rendering, to visualization. And so in this process, you want to, you want to put the materials at the, at the heart of uh, the design phase itself. 
you don't want to, let's say you're designing an interior of a, a car, uh, of course materials play a very, very important part in, in designing this, uh, this part of that car. So here uh, the list goes from very, very growing very quickly, like goes from BMW to, to Ikea via Playmobil, um, the NASA, the NASA uh, and that's, that's cool. And, and Louis Vuitton and people like this, right? Anyway, so very happy to show these, uh, to show these, uh, these examples and this, uh, this list of, uh, of companies actually using, using substance. But uh, when, actually this is where I, I speak about me a little bit. Uh, where I started, before starting the company, I actually got caught in, into a, a car accident. And I was, uh, it was like at the turn of last uh, century. And I, I, I had a head injury and I lost about six months of my life. So I, I forget about six months. And also, I don't know if you've seen that movie, it's called uh, Memento, if I recall well. Right? So in the Memento movie, basically the guy actually resets his mind uh, uh, every, every day. And that happened to me as well. So every three minutes, my father would tell me, every three minutes I would say, I would ask the same question over and over again. So I started to really wonder, what is random? What is randomness? Are we deterministic? Are we really like, programmed to come up with a set of questions, a set of jokes even? And my father would tell me, you, you would constantly repeat the same joke every three minutes. Because I would, I would ask basically, where am I? What happened? Uh, and I, was, I would end up with the same joke. I don't remember what joke, but I have a good excuse now not to, not to remember, right? And so I started to get into a very much a, like the math and the philosophy almost uh, behind randomness and random processes, and I got interested in that, so I started to study this, right? And I started studying, studying random processes such as this, uh, this noise function here on the left, which is a, a fractal, uh, similar uh, Brownian motion, uh, which is self-similar, it's a fractal, right? And I started to deal with this type of stuff right during my PhD. And this is actually um, a wavelet uh, representation, decomposition of random Gaussian random processes. So I started working with that. And by the way, uh, random, the random aspect is coming from that thing here in that case. Anyway, building stuff like this with trees. Uh, so from, uh, for you who are using maybe Substance Designer, in Substance Designer you have the, what is called the FX maps. And this is the FX map, basically. Uh, it's, a, it's a tree that represents uh, a space, zero, one space. And you can build these functions and stuff that look a bit, going back a bit, uh, like this uh, in the end, right? So I would, I would start using, uh, using this type of math and, and generate a lot of realizations of various um, uh, trees and, and uh, wavelet decompositions of uh, random processes. Um, and that would lead to something like this on the left here that was supposed to look like the clouds on the right. And I remember actually going to the head of the lab at the time when I was a PhD student and showing, showing this very, very proudly to him and saying, well, you see, I've generated this. Uh, it's a cloud. And he looked at me and said, do you often look at clouds, really? <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I knew I needed to, to work uh, harder. But that was the start. That was, as it was actually a, a procedural uh, texture. Uh, in, a, in a sense, so it was a way of using math and using procedures to come up with uh, noise functions and uh, and textures in that uh, in that example. So eventually, I, I, uh, I would make that work. And so during my PhD again, uh, the prototype I was developing based on the formula I've, I've shown you before actually would help me producing this type of results here. Um, here it's an actual photograph of the wall from um, uh, my lab uh, when I was a PhD student again. So it was a photograph and I say, well, how can I actually tweak the parameters, the numbers, the, the values, and going back, how, I can, how can I give the proper value to this uh, H value, to this uh, X and this uh, G, and et cetera, et cetera, right? How can I make that produce some, that looks something that like, looks like this, right? And so I ended up finding the right uh, parameters, the right set of parameters that would produce this noise function, then I used that, used that noise function as a height map and then colored the final result to obtain this on the right, on the top right. So that was the first texture, actually, that uh, the early, very early prototype version of Substance uh, would produce, um, like it was end of 1998, I think, or something like this, 1999. And 
by the beauty of it is that by tweaking these parameters slightly, I would explore the neighborhood of uh, that given process that I gave life to somehow. And so that, that was the, the initial one. And then by just randomizing the random, I mean, putting a different random seed, uh, would obtain a different re realization of that process. And then by slightly modifying G, the capital G, I would obtain so something different here in the shape of uh, what you see here as the, the, the paint drops, right? And so that was, again, the beginning of exploring the parameter space and obtaining something different uh, out of uh, one uh, procedural process. So that kind of summarizes it, uh, how I went from my PhD thesis to texture synthesis, right? Via uh, something that, that I hurted a bit, but anyway. And uh, it's about now procedure, uh, uh, procedural techniques. And what is procedural techniques? Procedural techniques are um, ways uh, that uh, recipes, I like the way Simon presented it earlier today, um, recipes to, to come up with a final result that you, that you want to obtain or like. But the recipes are either written in plain code, like in this case here. This code actually generates this uh, fractal Voronoi pattern and by changing some of these parameters that you can see here, like this 097, or this, uh, uh, like two post <laughs> these, these, these values, right? You can obtain something different, right? Uh, a good example is actually Shader Toy. I don't know if you've been to Shader Toy already. It's a website. You go to type Shader Toy. It's made by a guy called Inigo Kiles. Inigo um, is, I mean, used to be a demo, uh, demo coder uh, from the demo scene. I don't know if you, know this as well, but uh, the demo scene, I, I used to have an Atari uh, ST back in the time. Uh, the demo scene was super, super huge for Atari, for Amiga, and it's basically this, uh, these guys uh, programming entire worlds with as little data as possible. So it's, uh, it's the, the pinnacle of uh, procedural uh, techniques, actually. And uh, this, this guy, Inigo, uh, used to work at uh, uh, Pixar, Actually, before I went to Pixar, I tried to hire him. To hire him, but he told me, "Well, I got the, the dream job," and he went, went to Pixar. So, <laughs> I understood. And then he, now he's at uh, Oculus, uh, I think, but I'm not sure. But uh, basically, here is a good example. Hopefully, hopefully it works. So basically, what you see here, yeah, it works. Great. So this basically is is the result. This image here, this animation, is completely generated with the piece of code that you see on the right here. And the rendering part of it, the like generation of the rocks, the moss, the clouds, the heat effect, uh, the shadows, uh, the movement, etc. Everything is like in this very short program here you can find on the right. So you can either like learn from it, also play with it when you're on Cheddar Toy. So I, I strongly invite everyone to just look at this. It's it's mesmerizing to be fair. So. Another good example here is uh, if, you, if you do this, like it's from Brad Smith, uh, at, uh, used to be at Naughty Dog, now is at Epic Games. Um, if you combine this primary form here, that height map, with these two, like uh, there is a plus here, you, you, you obtain this final, final uh, uh, texture here. And if you use that as a height map, you obtain this, uh, this landscape, right? So now if you basically represent that process, not in a, in a code form, let's say, take this image, add, uh, add, add it to this other image, uh, obtain something that you add to uh, the third uh, image. Um, but you represent that in a visual way, you obtain a graph, right? It goes from the left to the right, and all the red nodes are inputs, can be noise functions, can be uh, pictures, can be anything. And, do, and all the, the these, these processes, this green process, for instance, can be a, can be a blend, simple blend on an addition. And you obtain uh, final outputs here that are like the maps that represent the digital material. In that case, this would. Uh, this, this has been done by Josh Lynch, by the way, who is at Red Storm uh, Entertainment right now. And uh, using this, this technique, lately we've seen it in the past, let's say three, four years, we've seen an increase, an incredible increase in the quality of uh, the materials people would obtain with these techniques. Where, where before it used to be super techy, super complicated, and the look would be super mathematical if I want to uh, be honest. 
Now it looks real and, and it looks as good as you could obtain with scanning something and extracting all the unnecessary info and obtaining something pristine. And pristine can be uh, uh, decayed as well, but this is, if this is what you want, right? But now, I mean, there is no, uh, I mean, I've seen so much quality in what, uh, what uh, uh, the masters of procedural texturing uh, in that case uh, can do. So procedural techniques, you know what this is now. Um, how, how can they help people? Uh, and there are two main categories, basically. Uh, the one is like being more creative. Uh, and again, Simon here is a very, very good example of how to embrace uh, procedural techniques to produce something that is not really expected, but is unexpected and, uh, and absolutely beautiful, right? So it can help you being more creative. But it can also help you uh, being more productive. Uh, either you use the time you save to refine what you, what you obtain using the procedural techniques, or you can, you can just save time and money, right? So I will start with this first, this, uh, this latter, uh, and uh, illustrate uh, this idea. Procedural techniques can help you produce complex, complex stuff. This is, this is an example from Autodesk uh, uh, Project Dreamcatcher. And the idea here is that they use these techniques to um, produce this, this bike frame, knowing you have a set of constraints like weight, uh, uh, rigidity, um, I don't know, beauty, colors, whatever. But, and what the algorithm would come up with several solutions. And producing all these solutions, and some of them you, you couldn't produce yourself, right? So you want to use uh, sometimes uh, procedural techniques to help you producing something that is very complex, very complex in the sense that there are many elements to take into account to come up with something that makes sense. Another, another good example is um, SRI or SRI, um, the city engine um, uh, used to be a, a company called Procedural, by the way, who uh, got sold to uh, SRI. Um, and city engine has been used to create um, like lots of cities and, and environments this way, but a good example was on Blade Runner uh, 2049, uh, the latest uh, Blade Runner. Uh, the um, Las Vegas city has been uh, produced uh, using, using this tool, so the, um, a good example is here. So all these, these environments, all these uh, uh, buildings have been created by an algorithm, uh, or part of them have been created by algorithms, right? So again, you can combine them again, you can start from there and add your your final touch at the end of it, but it can be, it can be super helpful. It turns out uh, it also has been textured partly with, um, with procedural techniques because Substance Designer has been used on that, on that movie. So uh, this, uh, these are the materials you can, you can see uh, in, the, um, in the scene that have been used in the scene. Uh, and these materials have been produced using uh, Substance Designer. So I'm very proud of this. And they got the Oscar for it. And speaking of the Oscar, I like to to show that image, you, you might know that guy here on the left, although he's uh, turning back. But um, these are the main guys from the uh, side effects, Houdini. And uh, Kim super happy to get his, uh, his statuette, obviously. But basically, uh, Houdini, Houdini is maybe the, the master example when you want to think about procedural techniques. And Houdini now, I, will, I want to show you just like a, a few examples of uh, uh, the work done by uh, Udini, Houdini uh, users, uh, if it loads up, yeah, it does. So all that content and all these um, uh, like fine elements, uh, simulation, uh, fluids, uh, smoke, um, like the stuff that breaks, stuff that dissolves or dies, whatever, uh, when you want to, to do a lot of destruction, there is no point in having one guy doing it by hand, right? Or even 100 guys doing it by hand. Uh, you, want to, you want to get the help of computers. You want to get the, the help of algorithms to do this for you. And this is where Houdini usually plays a, a big role uh, in, uh, in producing this for you. Right, a few more examples of uh, materials that I like that are very, very complex and it would be uh, quite difficult to produce, um, to produce by hand, I guess. Um, here you go. Yeah, I like these ones. So this is this is representing uh, a 3D printing process. With uh, same thing, same thing here with a different uh, different type of uh, parameters. Um, anyway, again, there is no point in having somebody 
doing this, not only because it would take time, but also because it would be complicated to do. Actually, when you ask anyone to say draw, I mean place randomly dots on a piece of paper, it's not random. What you obtain will not be random. So if you want true randomness, I mean true, <laughs> true randomness, I don't know what this is, and this is going back to uh, car crash and all, but anyway, um, if you want more randomness and more laws uh, and different distributions, you want to uh, programmatically uh, get uh, helped, right? Because again, by hand, we're, we're not programmed to, to do real white noise, real like Poisson uh, laws, whatever you can think of. Um, again, I was talking about uh, the beauty of what you can ex expect. This, 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 I th this is the, uh, um, a photograph and this is a rendering uh, of, um, not only the rendering is good, right? But uh, and I think actually um, V-Ray has been used on that one. I'm not sure, but I think. Um, so not only the rendering is good, so lighting is good, uh, um, viewpoint is, is, is good, etc. Modeling is good, but the materials are good as well, right? Anyway, this, this is interesting also because uh, this, there is no geometry in there, zero. It's a simple uh, cylinder. And everything is coming from the, the material. So the material is defining not only, not only the colors, but also the shapes uh, using height maps and normal maps and, uh, and the mix thereof. Um, so it's, um, it's really impressive what uh, people like uh, Abel uh, can, can obtain. Another good thing about procedural techniques is what we call data amplification. And data amplification is, is very simply illustrated by the, this. Let's say you have obtained 8K textures, so 8, 8K map of albedo, 8K map for uh, roughness, 8K map for metallic, 8K map, 8K normal map, 8K height map. You have all this information, right? It's so a lot of data. Actually, you can tweak some of the parameters to obtain different variations, and I will go back to that uh, after, to obtain slight variations in uh, the color here. You can obtain dozens, hundreds, thousands of these 8K maps from actually one file of uh, 185 kilobytes. So this is what we call a data amplification. You have a small amount of data in that file that represents this graph that says, okay, if you execute that graph, you will obtain that material. If you input these different parameters, you will obtain a different material, but these parameters are only numbers that are inputted at the generation time. So the representation of the process itself is very, very compact. So that can be helpful when distributing uh, data over the network, uh, even though we have very high bandwidth uh, um, networks now, uh, it's, it, can be, it can be super useful. Um, all right, variations and animations. Uh, I was talking about that just before. It's very simple, this, this idea of once you obtain this, this guy here, this material, it's very simple again to change few elements to, like in that case, for instance, to change the pattern uh, that it's combined with to obtain a different uh, realization and different colors. And again, change, change it again, change maybe the, the very uh, fine details of that fabric itself. Uh, a good example is, uh, is he, oh, sorry. It's, uh, it's illustrated here as well. See why um, data amplification is good. Anyway, so this is a good example where you, 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 the uh, user is playing with the parameters that have been exposed for that given graph and that given material to obtain something, to explore basically the uh, parameter space and obtain something he wants to obtain. So here it was a very, very like um, uh, theoretical thing. In that case, it's more like a wood grain. What type of good grain do you want? What colors? There is no point in having like 1,000 variations of a given wood type um, when you can obtain all these using a slider, right? You get the idea. Good example is this guy as well. So this is an actual photograph, and this is a, a, a procedural representation of it. And again, no, no geometry in there. Uh, it's, all in the, uh, it's all in the material, it's all in the maps that are defining um, the properties of the material. And sometimes these maps are used, as Chris was saying this morning, sometimes these maps are used to actually tess tessellate and, uh, and, uh, and create actual geometry in the GPU at some point, or, um, stored somewhere if you want to do a rendering over a CPU, a CPU, a network of CPUs. Finally, um, 
we, we usually uh, hear a lot of people complaining about procedural techniques because it's a, they, they think that it's a zero or one thing. Uh, it's not a zero or one thing. You can have hybrids. You can, you can very well do uh, sculpting but using uh, um, stamps that have been procedurally generated. And this is the case in that example here where um, uh, Rogelio uh, from Naughty Dog is actually using these maps that he's been creating in Substance Designer in ZBrush to sculpt these elements, right? And what we say is, is, is interesting, is using uh, what procedural techniques are good at, it, which is producing a lot of content very quickly for you, but you don't have to stop there. It's not the end of the process. It can be only the beginning of the process. So generating this large number of variations can be helpful in the, in the creative uh, uh, process. And maybe one of the best examples that we have at uh, Allegorithmic is uh, the use of uh, um, particle, uh, particles to paint. And uh, here you have like this, the input by, by the user is saying, okay, I want a wound here, but when the, the, the blood drops, if it's encountering uh, a different material, the skin or the fabric, it will behave differently, but it will do for you. So you don't have to do it by, by hand again. So this is, this is again a mix of like a, a gesture that says, okay, I want to paint here, I want to want to make a wound here, but then the rest is generated for you. So this is the inverse process here, where instead of starting from something procedural, you start with something um, artistic, human, and then uh, expand it with um, uh, procedural techniques. So I was talking about like this, this, this is helpful for the creation of more stuff, more quickly, more efficiently. Also people just like to, to use procedural techniques to, to do crazy stuff that wouldn't be possible with um, without, uh, without this technique. So sorry about the resolution here, but um, this, this is interesting. This is, this is, doesn't mean anything, right? But it's beautiful and, uh, and can be only done by, with the help. I mean, it could be done by hand, but it would take like infinite time. It can only be done here with uh, the help of um, procedural techniques. More examples like this, you remember in, in uh, Interstellar. Um, this has been procedurally generated to some degree, and mostly, actually. And this morning, I, I added this for you, Simon, because uh, this is a great example of uh, using procedural techniques to create um, whatever you have in mind. Right. Uh, this is another great example. Not only uh, you, you can find these techniques used uh, uh, in entertainment for games and film, but also for... Uh, architecture and good example is uh, Zaha Hadid uh, and uh, and uh, Elmut uh, Elmut Potman. Um, they 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 are, I mean, what they've produced using these techniques is uh, stunning. If you don't know it, please uh, check it out. Anyway, um, final maybe little thing that uh, is fun to 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 think about because it's procedural. You can you can actually plug into all these parameters, not, not sliders, but anything. It could be uh, MIDI controllers like, uh, like these guys and, and, and have fun with that. So it can be a very also, like just exploring uh, the parameter space can be also uh, an experience in itself and could be very, very visceral because you live it with your hands and it's, there is no, no more barriers uh, between you and, and the result, right? So I don't know if you've seen that. The amount of things you can obtain by is playing with maybe like seven, uh, tweaks, not that many, and is obtaining a, a large, large number of, uh, of variations. So I was talking about this inverse process. Good thing about procedural techniques also is that sometimes um, if your mathematical model, um, I mean, not if, but sometimes your mathematical model l lets you estimate some parameters, right? So I've been working a lot on that. So like statistical uh, estimators, you give an image and says, okay, this, this is a fractal dimension. So you have many ways to, to come up with this. And lately, we've seen uh, improvements in that. And this, this, this guy, for instance, extracts these shapes, this structure, these um, symmetries from this sparse information at the beginning. So I don't know if you, you, you see what I mean, but you only have this part. And the algorithm will not only see that there is some kind of a symmetry here, but it will extrapolate for you then the rest of the shape. So from there, you can build and rebuild uh, stuff, or you can analyze nature and say, okay, here's the uh, 
um, the set of rules that I can extract from it and then maybe reuse to produce something different. AI love procedural, um, many reasons for that. Um, AI is another new technique that is coming up, and uh, we, uh, I mean AI, like machine learning or deep learning. Um, and uh, it's definitely interesting, and we're, we're trying, we're, I wanted to show you something today, we, we, don't, we don't have it ready yet, but uh, we're working on something, but why, why do I say so? I say I love procedural techniques, because procedural techniques, as I told you, from one, uh, process, you can obtain variations. So what AI and deep learners love is massive amount of data to learn from. So if you're capable of saying, well, okay, I give you 1,000 realizations of that given material because I tweaked the random seed, I tweaked a bit, little bit the, 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 the parameters, but it's basically the same seed, the same process at the heart of it. Uh, now learn how to from these 1,000 uh, realize, different realization taken under, under different uh, uh, render, render views, know how, learn how to uh, go back to the original one. So you train an AI to recognize any material. So now I can give it this photograph of that guy, and if he's been trained to associate the real, that realization to something that is potentially procedural or not, uh, you have something that's, uh, that's interesting. So procedural can help producing the amount of data that AI techniques and deep learners need to actually um, uh, learn, uh, learn better. Um, yeah, I like that image. Uh, but AI, AI is one more tool in the arsenal, but obviously, by the way, just uh, as a side note, you won't ask uh, an AI to learn how to, to solve that equation all the time, right? Because we know how to solve it, right? It's, it's simple. So you don't want to use AI to solve that because science works, <laughs> right? So sometimes AI and deep learning and et cetera. I mean, for now, it, there is no point in having an AI know perfectly how to come up with this C given A and B. Right, so anyway. Um, to conclude, maybe. Um, uh, what we like at uh, Algorithmic is, um, uh, what I wanted to show you is procedural techniques, what they are useful for, um, and what they can bring to the artist. And in, with this in mind, uh, I like to think that uh, procedural techniques, like many techniques, like the Camera Obscura, uh, are here to help the artist, right? And Camera Obscura uh, has, been, has been super important for artists like uh, Ingris or Ang, uh, whatever, and Warhol, to actually, <laughs> to actually um, paint and draw, but it's basically they became renderers because it was using optics. I don't know if you know Camera Obscura, but it's basically an optics methodology that lets you project the image of what you want to capture onto your canvas. And then you just, I mean just, you apply the colors that you see that are projected, right? So. Um, there is a, a, a wonderful book by uh, David Hockney uh, called The Secret, Secret Knowledge uh, that talks about this and proves the fact that actually to come up with these, all these variations, all these fine details in the fabric, the very fabric of these um, paintings, uh, they had to use uh, optics, right? So it was, a, it was more a copy, a beautiful copy, right? but uh, then, uh, then, uh, then something coming up, coming out of, uh, of their minds. And this is very visible here. Uh, in the book, you see how we come from rendering metal from this, this way of rendering it to that way. And this is very visible here. This is an actual photograph, and this is the painting, right? So to come up with this, they, they got the help of optics. They used the, the help of optics at some point. Um, and I strongly invite you to get to look at this book, The Secret Knowledge by David Hockney, that explains this basically uh, very, very well. But basically, I like to think that procedural techniques, like any, like a lot of other techniques, are here to help the artist and empower the artist. So again, it's not about procedural techniques replace the artist. They, they empower the artist. That's what I, I wanted to say today. Um, I point, I'm pointing at uh, this, uh, this paper I wrote like three, two and a half years ago. Uh, it's been published. Uh, you, can, you can get it here. It's, uh, it's, it's called The New Age of Procedural Texturing. It, when reading it, uh, uh, we're in the middle of it. That's, uh, that's what I'm, that was the, 
I was saying it was the beginning of it. We're in the middle of it now. I mean, in the middle. We're way more advanced than three years ago. And finally, final note, if you're, we're, we're always hiring talented people. So if you're like us, uh, let me know and join the team. And thank you.